thank you all for your presentations. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I'm, I'm really struck by how important community is to each of your work and by how much each of you has already done within your community to give back and to really work to maintain and strengthen traditional practices and traditional values. All of you have spoken of the value of teaching what you know to youth and other community members as a way of instilling or strengthening both personal confidence and cultural, pr cultural pride, and I, I really admire the work that you've done. Um, three of the four of you, Holly, Natalie, and Gerald, are now at some distance from the communities where you were raised. Um, will, will each of you talk a little bit about um, whom you consider your community or your communities to be? and how your work is connected to and draws from or responds to your home or community. <laughs> you guys. Uh, I'll start that. Okay. And Gerald. <laughs> um, I'm originally from Cotsview, and, and that is a long way from uh, where I live now. However, um, I keep pretty well connected uh, my family still lives up there. Um, but teaching in an urban environment in Anchorage with the school district and the Heritage Center, um, uh, I find it even more rewarding uh, just because it, uh, a lot of those students aren't connected to their village, like I said before, uh, or, their, or their families. Um, uh, so I'm starting from nothing, which uh, is a benefit to me because I am no expert, but. Um, I can teach what I, what I have learned. Um, um, I have done stuff in Kotzebue, and, and I enjoy that too. But I find in the urban environment that I, I have a lot more freedom to, um, to teach uh, what, I, what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your question. It does, and you've talked a little bit about how, um, well, first of all, that your, your project is going, your workshop is going to be in Alaska with the, the, uh, with the school district. With the, right, uh, with the Anchorage project. School District. Right. right. Yes, I'm sorry, in, in Anchorage. And, um, and so you'll be working a lot with, with urban kids who are maybe less closely connected to their, right. um, to their background. Okay, and would someone else like to? You want to know about our community? Is that Sh did I understand? Sure. <laughs> who you consider your community or your, or your communities to be, and how your work really responds to or draws from the community, uh, or or, or and, and your home. Uh, the closest people in my community are the longhouse people because mm -hmm. uh, when you go through ceremony and we did reburials also in uh, the area of Toronto, it brings us closer together. Mm -hmm. uh, we share the same values also, and. Uh, for us, uh, our roots are important. Um, also, I think the language team, that's also my community because we work so hard on the language to uh, take a language from its dormancy and bring it alive. Uh, it's quite a task and uh, it's not always easy, but uh, uh, we work together and continue and continue and bring new <coughs> blood to the that small community. So these are also, uh, uh, part of my closer community and I miss them a lot and the fact that I'm away I feel really grateful uh, to have the chance to go back and bring something back because you always feel that a part of you is stays there when you have to go and you work on your tribal language because um, it takes so much time to gain that knowledge and then when you go away you feel like you're bringing something with you that should stay there and with today with the technology, uh, there is opportunities to work uh, from distance, so I'm going to explore this too, but uh, to be there live with the kids and um, teach them what I can gain from my experience being in the U.S., I think uh, they're go it's going to open their world too and make them see that they can do things too. <laughs> well, for me, you know, I'm still in the community, and I've already did some pre-advertisement for what the program's going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, we have four sister tribes, so I've already been in contact with the people down south, and I even had interest from uh, Colorado River tribes as well. But I even had a, a guy approach me from San Carlos, because he wants to learn. The, the concept of making the tribal bow is not different because there's a lot of uh, 
the manuals that you have out there that show you how to make a bow are normally uh, considered long bows, which is an English bow. And so that's their example, and that's what they use. Because I've come across different bow makers, and that's what they've always used was a long bow. But I, um, what I want to teach is our traditional bow. Because I'm lucky I have this old bow, and that's my model. And so that's my part of uh, the, the project is actually to re-educate the people that are, that are within our sister tribes. And I, I like that you, you talked also about um, really working closely with fathers and sons and yeah. really uh, kind of creating, um, teaching the fathers to teach it to their sons and then the sons will know how to teach it to their own sons. Yeah, it's really important because identity is our, our biggest struggle. We're in the middle of uh, uh, an urban area. We have Mason on the south of us, we have Tempe that's uh, uh, southwest of us, we have Scottsdale to the west of us, we have Fountain Hills to the north of us. So we're actually surrounded. And uh, identity is a big struggle because they have to deal with the outside mm -hmm. and deal with their personalities that are there, bring it back into community. Uh, and so it, it is an ongoing thing for me. And why I see it as important because in, a, in another way I'm lucky too is that I grew up next to my grandparents. Uh, they had no boarding school background, which is a big, big uh, um, plus for me because their attitude about uh, teaching and having children right next to them because they wanted us right at their side and we walk along with them and do the different things that they do. And uh, they didn't have the restrictions of uh, uh, like some other boarding school uh, parents or grandparents, which uh, their teaching was the child's to be seen and not heard and to be pushed away to the side and have to grow up separately from, from the family. That was a big difference in me growing up. Uh, because of that, uh, I feel that is, I feel there's a dog in here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I feel that it, the identity is the, the biggest issue we have because even the area that I'm going to be gathering the materials from, it's, a, it's called the Verde River. So, uh, the water actually comes from Flagstaff. It comes all the way down here to the Phoenix area. Uh, the, uh, a lot of kids that I have taken out the river have never been to the river. And so that's a major thing. Even when I do the hiking in the area, they've never hiked around that area. So identity is a big struggle that we have. I think that's a nice connect connection to your planned workshop, Gerald, because you're also planning on taking people out, taking the men you're working with out into um, into the landscape and harvesting clay, and then working from there to build, to build pottery, right? Yes. I really miss the community, the, the bonding that we did together, mostly with the men, going and cutting wood for the sweat lodge, gathering rocks. It's, it's it really meant a lot to me and to make this journey east gives me an opportunity to find a connection still with the community I'm excited about going back home I'm excited about being in the community again and teaching which I've been doing for 10 years now empowering empowering the students empowering the community showing them something new that they can use and that's what it's really all about is giving back to the community who has given so much to me and my family so just as a way of saying thank you to them yeah. and i think you you in particular have talked too about how important this project of, of reviving pottery and of, of helping people to make things with their hands can be to building self-esteem and self-confidence in a place where there's so much hardship and um, is, is there anything more that you want to say about that? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I and you, you've all talked some about your your planned workshops, but I'd like to hear a little more. Um, hear you each talk a little bit more in specifics about what you're planning to do with your workshop and about um, what kind of impact you hope that it's going to have on the community and on um, and and how it builds on or relates to the work that you've already been doing. Me again? Yeah. <laughs> um, really quickly. Um, the workshop. Mm -hmm. 
the spirit board, uh, having the kids find things that they're interested in and creating a spirit board and then inspiring more work out of them. Mm -hmm. I'm not expecting to reach every student or um, uh, even uh, get every student that interested in art, but if I could reach a few students, mm -hmm. as it only took one teacher to get me interested, um, that that will be a, a wonderful um, accomplishment for me. But um, yeah, the workshop sh uh, it is being planned with the school district, so it's 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 pretty regimented, and we're trying to keep it pretty themed. Mm -hmm. um, but um, hopefully, uh, yeah, it works out well, and I can reach a few students. And and so I think you're you're both both teaching them screen printing and also bringing back imagery right. for them to see from. So we're doing a collage, so. right? A collage, and then uh, screen printing is an option. Um, we might do linoleum. We'll have different things available for each student, and I'll have um, other teachers there to help me um, get each student through every process. So, I think uh, to share what's in the collection, so they know that what the beautiful things that our ancestors did, and also to see the water drums or the rattles from the other Iroquoian tribes. Uh, there's not so many makers of water drums. We have one on, in our community, and they don't get a chance to see it a lot uh, if they're beside in the longhouse or for some a few events. So I think this is good for them to see uh, the different instruments. And since I'm a, I was trained as a musician, maybe I can help because sometimes the singers they don't read music, and a lot of the archive. Uh, you have musical transcriptions, so it doesn't do nothing for them. So if I can help them in learning the song uh, with my knowledge of music mm -hmm. and my knowledge of language too. I have a facility with languages and uh, we speak French and that brings us a bit uh, away from the other Iroquoian community because of the language barriers. So, and at least uh, bringing back their own language and using just a few words uh, you're keeping the language alive. So through songs, it's much easier to learn. That's what I found out. So they can use it through song and you plant a seed and later on you have a plant, so. <laughs> and, and I really like too that you talked about um, working, with, working with the kids to find ways of bringing the language back into whatever kind of music they're interested in and making it contemporary. So. Mm -hmm. Even texting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, cultural, uh, I guess, confidence. Because uh, when I think about the the idea of actually making a bowl, it's one thing. But you got to think about the teachings behind it. Because I'm going to assist them to make a bowl. But once they make their first bowl by themselves, they have to give that one away. Mainly because it guarantees the next one they make is to be better than that one. Uh, for every item that I have that I've ever made, I've given that first one away mm -hmm. when I completed it all by myself. And that's what I want to teach with them. But also the working with, the, with an older male uh, to a younger male and having to understand that responsibility they have. Because if they went hunting with it, they just can't kill things. Okay, they just, and, and they, because the old teaching is that the first time they, uh, kill something in their first hunt, they don't eat it. It's given to somebody else. Uh, so they have to keep those in mind too. So there's a lot of you know, different things that's gonna be involved in it, more than just having to make a bowl, because there is a lot of value in what you do. Uh, the reason that Phoenix exists today is because we were there. We had a warrior society that protected the, the train that went to Phoenix. We also had, a, the, our society also protected the traveling from from, uh, that was going across country to California, mm -hmm. and that was our responsibility. So it's more than just making a bowl. And I think, and, and you're also going to take the, the group out into yes. the, to, to collect all of the different materials yes. that you use and make it from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So I, I zoned out, can you? Can you <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Um, would you talk a little more about your, about your workshop and um, uh, what kind of impact that you hope it's going to have? I mean, you've, you've, you've talked about this some already, um, and and about how how it connects to the work that you that you've been doing yourself. 
Well, I hope to bring back what everyone's saying here, a sense of pride to the community, mm -hmm. showing them something new that they can build upon and teach from generation to generation. What I've found in my research is that it doesn't take a lot of money to do this. Mm -hmm. It takes time. So a lot of people will say they have more time than money. So that's what I, I hope to teach them is that they can take this art form and put designs in there that mean something to them and uh, sell those. So as a way of uh, profiting off their, their craft. Okay, um, now I'd like to talk a little, a little more about um, your research and the time that you've spent here in collections. Um, would each of you talk a little bit about, about the time you spent in collections, what you've seen, um, what you've done, um, have, you, have you found what you hoped to find, or um, were there things that surprised you? And again, all of you talked a little bit, or, or some of you talked a little bit about things that surprised you or that you were especially excited to find in the collection. I, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't, uh, like um, these guys, I didn't find anything um, that was um, personally connected to me. However, I found so many beautiful and intricate small, small designs and, and useful tools. Um, some of my favorites, just thinking um, there's a whole collection of dolls um, that are stone and um, bone that um, are beautiful and have trade beads and um, are from the Northwest Arctic area in Alaska. Um, also fishing lures, I mean the intricate and amazing fishing lures. Just, uh, I've been really surprised at um, how much is available here and um, the diverse, um, the diversity of the collection. And um, I selfishly spent I don't know, hours looking at earrings, ivory earrings, um, that I'm sure my students won't be interested in, but that I personally loved, loved, loved. Well, and, the, and this research is meant not only right. to, see, it's, to it's both to take back to right. community, but also to inspire you. Yes, and it has. I have so many ideas, right? Yeah. So, yes, I'm very honored. I, I bought a buffalo horn flute in Seattle at a festival. And I thought, well, this is not traditional from us, but uh, I'm so drawn to the buffalo. And uh, I found a buffalo flute in the archives, I record buffalo flute, so I thought, huh, maybe that's why I was drawn to that thing. Uh, I was surprised to find that. And uh, I didn't know if uh, we played flute. I know it's uh, the Lakota people. Uh, it's something very sacred for them. And I found, uh, I want to research more when the flute came to our, uh, our people, but uh, I saw there was uh, quite a few um, uh, flutes that were used that I, could, I was able to see in the collections. And the, the most uh, moving thing was when uh, the wampum I was going to see was the one in the picture that my great-grandfather great was wearing. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you just go back in time and then it's, it makes one, so. And were you able to also listen to some recordings of music? In the yes, course? that's what I'm doing these days. Um, uh, there's a lot, a lot of recordings. Mm -hmm. um, also, you need permission from the tribes, so I'm not just gonna take this and bring it back. And but it helps to see how they sing it. Uh, to uh, we have one singer, two, three singer, the most in our community. So, and I didn't get a chance to visit the other long houses. So, it's really uh, nice to be able to hear them also explain some of the songs they're singing. I'm learning a lot listening to uh, their presentations sometimes, or just listening to the language. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm gonna try to bring some of them back. Uh, some have been published, so maybe I'll be able to use these ones and uh, bring some new songs. And I bought some of the folkway CDs, so the Seneca songs uh, that Jean Gertrude Curat, I have all the, her, uh, she did a book and all the musical charts are there, so now I can link the, sometimes the, the songs with the, uh, the musical transcription and s understand more about it. So. 
Um, what I look at is that I enjoy lo looking at all the collection of the bows mm -hmm. and the arrows because it confirms and reconfirms the things that I do and how they're put together. Uh, the sadness is that having to look at the other, look at because I looked at a list of um, itemized objects that were in the collection and how much they were worth at the time. You know, 25 cents for a pot, you know, five dollars for a large storage basket, uh, four dollars for a, I was at 40 cents for a saddle. Uh, you know, just looking at all those itemized items, but what I, was, what I like from that is they actually have names connected to it from the Gila River. Uh, and uh, when you go back in history, one of the reasons that a lot of people were selling items is that when we had our river was dammed up, and yet we all lived off the river. Our existence is depending on that. That's what we call river people. Uh, the uh, so the sad part of it is having to uh, look back in the collections and see the records that were here, and to, but to realize the changes in lifestyle that happened for that to be in the collections. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it's a, it's kind of a both both ways, mm -hmm. emotional both ways, because you know for Ira Hayes both to be here, you know what got it to that point to be here, you know. Uh, but I'm glad I was able to find it. It's just that I, uh, I can't think about it so much because uh, then I'll get all hooked up about it. But nevertheless, the uh, I do have mixed emotions about all of it. But I'm I'm enjoying I'm enjoying what I'm being able to find, and it uh, encourages me to do more stuff. And uh, so that's what I like. Well, as a painter, I was drawn to the paintings. Mm -hmm. Some are very good. Some are okay and some are hard to look at. And then I started looking at all the tools and you could see the progression. And it was very interesting to see some of the arrowheads that were metal that were in embedded into bones of buffalo. And I was thinking about Royce because those bowls had to be really strong and powerful to get that far into it, buffalo. But the research led to so many different areas. So I'm really looking at all kinds of stuff. I'm just walking by shelves, grabbing stuff, pulling it out, looking at it, and then pushing it back in very carefully, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Trying it on, then putting it back. <laughs> I understand that this is the first time that the four of you have met each other and you've gotten to spend quite a bit of time together over the past couple of weeks. Um, have you discovered some connections among your work, among your interests, among your, your planned projects or your research? I'll, I'll start again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, uh, Gerald and I with the uh, uh, pointillism and his paintings and my buyer bottle caps and um, uh, friendships with everybody. It's been so valuable to, to meet these three other artists and, and um, just to talk with them and, and to feel so close. Uh, I keep saying I'm honored. I wish there was a better way to express um, how grateful I am. I, I do think that's a really nice part of this program too, that you all come at the same time and you spend this time together and, and and you're obviously coming from far, far away from Washington D.C. and trying to get around, so you, you know, kind of build up a, I don't know, a sense of kinship or friendship right. as you're navigating everything. So I think that's a, a really great part of the program. Oh, very good. <laughs> Motivation. That's what I see a lot of. Is yeah. you know what we're looking at it, and the things that we're finding out. It motivates us more to go back into community to do what we're going to do because. You know, even though our projects are completely different from each other, it's still a motivation for us to mm -hmm. to uh, look at the children and try to present something as a legacy that this is what you have before you. So that's what I see it as. You know, it's the our fact that we're so motivated to, for the help community. So that's where we're at. I agree with everything <laughs> you said. Much more Get to say. <laughs> uh, to see that uh, thing inside that is driving the four of us, that is there with the four of us, it's mm -hmm. kind of a family also because when you share the same values inside, 
you feel close in a way even if you don't know each other just from the being feeling close to our land and our people it makes them it makes us close together see i should speak in french <laughs> well as a young artist i always thought that i was going to make a million dollars just after I graduated with each one of my degrees, that never happened. And then I uh, came to the realization that it's not all about me, and it's about something bigger than each and every one of us. And we all go back to our communities and we all teach, and that's a passion of each one of us. So I, I think about the music that Natalie does, and I am inspired. I want to listen to more of what she's made. Um, Holly's work. I'm not going to steal your ideas. I might borrow. <laughs> <laughs> and Royce's designs. So I really enjoy looking at their work. Really quickly, too, we all had to survive the metro together. So you know what they say about people who are in disasters <laughs> together? <laughs> Are there questions or topics that I haven't touched on that you would like to discuss, or that you, do you have questions for each other that you'd like to you'd like to ask here? Can I visit your area? Yes, <laughs> yes. and please, leave some of it there. <laughs> please, yeah, please. to keep the contact would be nice because uh, we learn a lot from each other also. Mm -hmm. So, and we were in that experience together. So, I think it's. It would be great to keep the context, mm -hmm. and with the people here too, because uh, it's not just on a Smithsonian level; it's on a personal level that uh, mm -hmm. you share with people, and uh, um, it takes a certain kind of people to work in archives and museum, and they're very respectful. And uh, I was really happy to see that. And mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the uh, I guess the the biggest thing for me is that being here and looked at what you have here, uh, sometimes uh, to correct misinformation. And that was really uh, help, uh, that, uh, yeah, I know we were helpful in the collections because there's some items there that were mislabeled mm -hmm. and whatnot, and uh, for us to contribute to re -correct, you know, correcting that, I think uh, it's going to be beneficial for whoever follows behind me, mm -hmm. and the fact that if they go see the collections and they'll have better information, uh, what it is because we've been able to add a lot of different things to what is there even here in this museum as well mm -hmm. so it's um, it is a struggle to get um, the information it's I know the collectors when they did collect stuff they didn't make a lot of notes about it they didn't uh, um, they, they weren't doing research they were collecting mm -hmm. and so that was a, a big eye-opener for me because I can only learn so much information uh, but I had to rely on what people have told me in the past and uh, and see how it coincides with whatever I find. And that's, that's a big, uh, still a struggle, but that's part of the research. Yeah, and I think that that's a very important part of the work that we do with the collections here. And we always appreciate people sharing you know, additional information or corrections to the information that we have on. <clears throat> but I do want to shoot the bows. <laughs> <laughs> and play the flutes but I, know, I know it's not going to happen <laughs> well just staying in contact with these guys through Facebook or email and just continuing to have conversation and uh, maybe this is a good time to, uh, to open up to questions from the audience are there any questions for any of the artists or questions about the program we came in late. Can we get a reintroduction? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want us to reintroduce? Just who you are. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Shandai was Natalie Picard Yati. My French name is Natalie Picard. My Wendat Huron name is Shandai Was. I come from the Huron tribe, Wendat tribe, close to uh, 18 miles north of Quebec City in Canada. But we we uh, speak a language that is part of the Iroquois family, and I'm a musician, storyteller, composer, and I work on a language. Avant à te ramener tout à l'heure, une partie que tu as vu. 
Um, I, my name is Holly Northam, and I'm uh, Inupak from Kotzebue originally, Alaska. I now live in Anchorage. I'm a visual artist, and yeah. My name is Royce Manuel. I'm from Arizona, near Phoenix, Scottsdale Mesa area. And I do um, what, they call, what I call tools of yesterday. I try to reproduce uh, different materials or different uh, items, utilitarian items, a burden basket, a uh, three-hole flute, uh, bows and arrows, uh, that type of thing. Gerald Knoyer, originally from South Dakota and migrated to the East Coast here. <laughs> <laughs> and I am doing a project with pottery and reviving some pottery that was found in South Dakota. I'm originally a painter, and so it's gonna be a, a big learning curve for me to make pots in South Dakota. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I have a bit of a question, actually two for Gerald. Um, first of all, how does, did you say the 14th child? Yes, the youngest of 14. Favorite. Yes, I. <laughs> How do you get an MFA? I mean, that's just mind-boggling. Well, you spend a lot of money and go to several schools. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm more curious about, and I do consider myself a potter, but and I live here and volunteer for the museum. Um, I'm curious as to how you're going to incorporate clay into your own personal two-dimensional work, or are you moving to ceramics? For your own work, or just for this particular segment? I was, I was really thinking I'm just doing it for a workshop, and then I remembered that Picasso kind of dabbled in some ceramics later on in his career, yeah. and I thought maybe this would turn into something. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah, we'll see. Your next million. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is going to be the one. <laughs> Not yet. I was gonna just pick up a bag of clay somewhere and start playing around with it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> this this uh, question is for Gerald too, since he's my relative. I'm gonna put him on the spot. <laughs> um, uh, pottery for the for the plains area is really rare. I mean, it was it was something that was probably traded for. Have you thought out how are you going to create pottery? I mean, pottery, like how are you going to fire it? Are you going to use a kiln or fire? Or um, you, you talked about uh, you didn't find in the clay, digging the clay. Uh, do you know where they got to where that's at? Well, one of my friends has done some pottery, has dug up some clay and talked about how it's a different color. and So he was going to show me when I go back. And just looking at the pots that were created and watching, actually watched a couple of videos that were really, really, really old. And one is five minutes and the other one was like 25 minutes. But they showed the whole process of digging the clay, adding temper to the clay, uh, working with the clay, and the firing. The firing was actually just in a pit or on the ground using rocks to hold the pots up, uh, low fire. And it was interesting to see how the Zuni had a, I always thought those pots were flat on the bottom. And then I saw the Zuni, how they made it so that it has a, a an indention on the top of it, thank you. And that's how they're able to walk with the pot on their head. And I thought, wow, they must have great balance or something. <laughs> But you're going to do coil, right? Uh, yes, coil, and there are some tricks to it that I've seen the ladies use. Um, as a cultural practitioner myself, I was wondering how intimidating was signing up for this grant, and how difficult was it to actually achieve the the goals of that. And I guess there's, there's three questions here. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. 
I mean, just listening to you as applying for this grant seems much more intimidating because you have a professor, you have another um, highly educated people and, and somebody that just considers themselves somebody that uh, is straight off the reservation and um, doesn't have a degree or his focus is entire adult life on, on retaining and promoting the cultural heritage of our people. Um, how difficult was this to, to get involved with? I, I think the application itself wasn't um, bad at all. What what the hard part is, it's uh, the logistics of it and, and being uh, being here is great and that it's been busy, but um, you know, Kevin's done all the hard work getting our schedules together. So just, uh, but you know, um, organizing the classes before I came that uh, and working with the school district, working with the Heritage Center, um, bringing Tom to document the process and finding Tom and then and getting him excited to come document the process. And um, I mean, there was a lot before I even left the house. So. I have kids, so uh, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the education side, uh, you can always find somebody to help you to fill this application, mm -hmm. but what you carry inside, it's only you that carries it. And the way you talk and working at the cultural center, I think if you just bring yourself out, uh, that's that's what you should, the way you could do. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what, uh, could bring you here, I think. What mm -hmm. I said before about motivation, that's the biggest part of it because the obstacles that are put before you, like the legal and the obligations to the paperwork, you know, that's that's really minimal compared to what you have confidence in yourself and what you do. And right now, you know, all the work that you've done, you know, it just shows that. And you know a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It's just like, um, I come. I compliment you and Ron because we do things in a natural sense, and that's something that's lacking in a lot of different places. Uh, the uh, you have, but you have the confidence to do it, and you know exactly what you're going to do. You know how it's done. You figured out everything about it. Um, so it, it's uh, you really don't have too many obstacles in front of you to apply for this, and. Uh, uh, your options are yours, and you know whatever you want to do. Just be careful in the subway. I tell you, I tell you. I I think you have the number of hours. You probably have over ten thousand hours mm -hmm. spent mm -hmm. doing all of the work. So you're an expert in your field. Mm -hmm. The hardest part for me, like everyone here said. It wasn't the application, it was the SAM which was excruciating. Mm -hmm. So getting the contract through the government oh, was yeah. the hardest part. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All three of you have the most difficult challenges with the system of war management in my career. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Those three of us. The system awards management um, is a system that, uh, that the Smithsonian has uh, people uh, to fill out and register as contractors. The artists here are contractors um, to, to do certain activities and fulfill certain and provide certain products and services. So they have to fill out the system awards management registration but I always tell them that there's this little village in Puna, Peru, and this little island in Puna, Panama, and they're still filling them out. <laughs> so, what's the deal? <laughs> you know, they speak a whole other language, you know, and um, it, it's, it's possible. It can be yes. done. You know? Don't get overwhelmed with all the, the yeah. thing that's seems to scare you because everything you have inside and what you do with your art, I saw your art at the Casa Grande and uh, you would gain a lot from that experience, I think. So don't, don't, just go for it. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see. 
and I would encourage other artists um, to do the same. Yeah. I would. Um, it's been such a valuable experience. I would encourage um, anyone who has any interest to apply. I mean, the the technical stuff, Kevin will help you. <laughs> Kevin will do it. Yeah, he's smart. Yeah. <laughs> so. and, and when's the due date? So May, 5th? May, 5th? May 5th? May 5th? May 5th? May 5th? May 5th? May 5th? You have time. <laughs> and so, anybody that was to take any of your, your, your classes afterwards, would would you recommend them they apply for this grant also? Or this 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 program? Yes, I would. Yeah, because, you know, you'll always find somebody that's outstanding in the classrooms. That's you know, true. the last time uh, that was here, August Wood actually uh, sought me out find out somebody that knew how to make a burden basket. It took him a year's journey from going all the way to our sister tribes to come back that I just lived right down the road from him. <laughs> <laughs> but his journey was good because he went all the way across the reservation and he came all the way back again. Uh, and that's sometimes that's what's needed. And uh, But because of that, he learned a lot more than everybody else. And because of that, his motivation of having to do that, it's really opened his eyes and him and we invited here uh, to join me the last time here, and he took a lot out of this. And I just, and he, right now he's, he's still, he, right now he's on his mission, so when he gets back home, that's what he's looking forward to doing. He's doing a lot more. Thank you. Since um, government paperwork came up, I'm just curious <laughs> about what it was like to do um, these projects in the capital of the United States in view of the, <laughs> the capital building and whether um, that maybe made you think about the political importance of the work that you're doing as well as its importance um, culturally. Not that we can separate those things, but I'm just curious if the location of, of this project um, had any bearing on your process in terms of thinking about what it means in a larger sense. Well, I think time, the time that everybody is rushing out here, so you can get trampled on the, the subway because <laughs> people <laughs> want to get somewhere really fast. And on the reservation back home, you leisurely go along. You get there when you get there. That always baffled me about how everybody was rushing and like this morning, I forgot my flash drive, so I had to jump back on the train, go all the way back home, jump back on the train, and then get here, and then I'm running across <laughs> so you, every... So you, you, were one, yeah. you were one of them. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was pushing people out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I've adjusted well. <laughs> well, it was a nice day. <laughs> What I was finding really surreal is you're in these collections, like you're going in the past, really deep in the past, and then you get in the subway with all these people and you see all these uh, famous buildings and it's like, you feel a bit, uh, it's surreal. It's, for me, it was quite an experience because um, I'm from Canada also, so to be here, uh, um, it's hard to explain the, but the the difference than going into the archives and coming out in uh, Washington D.C. <laughs> was a uh, overwhelming and a great experience. It's um, uh, it's inspiring because you see so much contrast. Yeah. It's really inspiring because as an artist, you can use these contrast and all these emotions and put them in words and sounds. So yeah. <laughs> I agree with Natalie that the two worlds, right, this very ancient, when we come out and we're walking at the Jefferson Memorial, it's enormous, and I'm looking at little, little things, and then I see this big, you know, the contrast is so huge um, politically, uh, I hope, that us being here, speaking about what we're doing, um, raises awareness um, to the Native issues, to Native arts, to... And I hope, I hope. For me, it's twofold because this is where the whole United States started from. 
and the influences and decisions that were made here affected me over here where I'm at in Arizona. And all the stuff that our tribe's gone through is based on here. And all the struggles that we continue to have is still here. Because we have to come this way to argue different things. Uh, Land-based issues, water issues, everything here is here. Uh, sure, there's a, you know, historical sites here, uh, but it, that's why it's twofold. Because you know, I, I'm glad that for the collections that I come to see this, but this is the issues that started the reason that we're having struggles over here. Mm -hmm. So it's a really big, different thing, you know, to look at two different things. One is a recognizable capital, White House, and all the different memorials. But at the same time, this is what affected us where we're at right now. And so it is uh, two different things for me. Because uh, I'm trying to still deal with our identity, and that's my struggle dealing with my children, with uh, other people's children within our community, my grandsons, my great-grandsons, and granddaughters, great-granddaughters. Uh, because that's, I'm children still trying to um, uphold their identity. And uh, I'm constantly being influenced by outside. Uh, so that's where my struggle is. It's, it's an enjoyable visit. Uh, I got on the uh, subway and on Saturday, and I was the only <laughs> one going on the escalator, but somebody bumped me going down. There's only two of us. I mean, you know, <laughs> why bump me? I'm, you know, I'm the only one here. <laughs> but I guess that introduced me to, the <laughs> to this world here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just really quickly, um, 1971, right, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. So uh, my uncle and uh, my my grandmother's little brother were here. They were in their 20s. I'm 40 something. <laughs> but they were in their oh, 20s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were in their 20s. They're here fighting for Alaska Native lands. And um, that just, I mean, they were here in this environment and, and um, from the village. It, it just uh, blows me away That's from my Alaskan perspective. I'm very impressed with their ability to come here and fight for, for us. Was was there, like each of you guys, did you guys have, um, I think Roshi told me earlier, but did um, are you guys, or if you want to share, or is, did you guys have uh, an artifact that kind of like stood out? I know you mentioned something as well, um, but was it like a spiritual revelance, I guess? that you guys found in any of the artifacts? Um. Uh, what uh, I have found was, uh, I can't even talk about that, sorry. Okay. I was looking at all these pots and the pot shards, and one thing kept coming up. I'd seen over and over and over, and I would see this, image of a mound in my mind I was seeing these images of these mounds that were on the shoulder of the pot all the way around they'd have maybe four of them and I found one that had four of them it was a good example the line work and then I saw this spiral that started on the bottom of this pot and it looked like just lines around like this until you examined it. So I see the same design up here in the front of the building. And so I was starting to put all these connections together, you know, these prehistoric pots and all of the symbology that is still being used today. And I want to be able to pass that on to the next generation that looks at these and says, hey, I know the history of this the origins, how these were made. So. On a spiritual level, when you see some of the sacred objects in the collection, uh, you feel something. Uh, I don't know if it's a sadness or a, a sorrow or I don't know what's the word in English, but uh, and it reminds you that we're losing a lot. We lost a lot of our ways and uh, and our, of all the people that were there before. Um, I saw there are some objects are pretty strong still, the energy is there, so um, some of them are being uh, handled with respect 
and uh, some of them maybe would rather be somewhere else than in a shelf. But I guess that's how it is. But um, yeah, sometimes you could feel like even the object, you could feel things from the uh, the collections there. It's not all of it, but uh, um, I don't know how, how I can say more about that, that there are some sensitive things there. And I think it's good that like some of the object that the tribe said is sensitive, so they're not displayed. And uh, I think this is really important because maybe for some culture outside of native culture, they won't understand. But uh, these objects are alive and uh, um, they're part of our past and they need to be respected. And I think they are in a way, but also it, it you have a lot of questions when you go through these objects because you wonder and you see them in a drawer. The first time I went to the collection with Bread of Life, I felt a sadness around the collection. I felt like a, a heaviness. At the same time, you see like a, um, pieces of art that is not secret and uh, you see all the beauty of it also. So it's mixed feelings and uh, it's very moving, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I saw a lot. Like I said, I'm so inspired. Um, Spiritually, it's hard to say. Maybe when I uh, am able to step away, that I will realize <coughs> what affected me. It's very overwhelming to be here, so it's really hard for me mm -hmm. to say right now. But uh, I'll let you know. Any <laughs> <laughs> uh, questions? Yeah, uh, maybe I would like to add. Uh, since I was looking at musical instruments, I was looking at the water drums. And for me, the drum is really a sacred instrument. So I felt good about being able to see them. At the same time, I was wondering, should I, w should I be here looking at these drums? There was like part of me who felt uncomfortable even looking at these objects. But I know I want to use it in a good way. But uh, I know there are some pictures I won't show. And um, uh, but the knowledge uh, that I gained from seeing the colors they would use for the drums. I would share with the person who makes the drum. So I think it's a good way to honor. Um. Yeah, because one of the things too, you know, when you see the, uh, the items that are, that are in the collections is that I, I go in there thinking that uh, our people need to know this. Right. Mm -hmm. And we need to educate people because there's a lot of things in there that people only talk about, like the basketry. You know, we're stuck on so many, just so many limited number of different designs. Excuse me. But when I came here, oh man, the vast assortment of designs that are there it shows the creativity of the people. It's mm -hmm. beyond what we have seen before. And that what really opened my eyes. Uh, so it, it's also one other thing too that opened my eyes. is that we're all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, before there are struggles between uh, what they call the Pimas and Maricopas, even though we live in the same community. We're not this different than the other group. And so I have to look at all in the tribes and native tribes in Arizona. We're all the same. We use the same materials. We use do that where our struggles are the same. We survive the same way. And that's what we're seeing in the in the collections. Uh, there's only a few things that really have a lot of, you know, feeling to it. Uh, but uh, when they say all oh, these are sometimes are restrictive, which is fine. But I don't go in there with thinking that. I'm going to abuse that, you know, and it's, it's uh, something that I think, uh, like again, I was saying about identity, it's our connection to who we were at, at one time, and that's why uh, it's, for me, it's easy to go through, um, and it's just only in that one item that I actually had a lot of feelings for, but I understand the sadness and I understand everything that's connected to it, so um, other than that, yeah, I, I'm so glad to be here with that. It brought my art history courses to life, just looking at everything, yeah. actually. You know, a slide doesn't do it anymore. You mm -hmm. gotta physically handle something gently. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> no rattles. I have a question, though. Um, because you, you were talking about making your first million with the... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I assume 
the, the research is based on um, learning more about your craft, not only teaching it to the communities, but also um, advancing in your artwork. And so, well, <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever encountered people in your own community saying you should not be doing this, you know, it's not for money, we only did this for our cultural values? And, and then my other, I guess, um, addition to that is traditionally we did trade and we did not use money, but we live in a monetary society today and so um, the only way you would be proficient in making pots is if you did it over a thousand times. You know, the only way you'd be able to, to, to work on your shell work or your bowls or anything like that is if you did it more than one time. So there was specialists that specialized in these cultural art forms or, or crafts that you would only be able to do well if you did it multiple times and, and through trade is how we subsisted. So how do you guys answer those um, comments or do you even get them? Well, there are some taboos that we're not allowed to, we shouldn't be painting, and those are some of the ceremonial, some of the ceremonials. There are some out there, but they're not done by myself, or they're not done by tribal people that I know. So those are the things that I shy away from, because the backlash in the community. I guess um, as a contemporary Native artist, I, I want my art to um, make people think. And um, if that takes a little bit of, you know, not following the rules, I'm, o I'm okay with that. Um, so uh, I'm, there are taboo things, but I often do those things <laughs> <laughs> to get people to think and to think about uh, preserving culture and um, tradition. Uh, I decided I would teach a few, tr a few ceremonial songs to the kids because they are our future and to give them a sense of responsibility also and a sense of being important. Uh, I can carry that song because we need it for the ceremony and I, I can carry that song. But I want to bring the Longhouse Singers to that workshop when I'm going to do this. Uh, and I will teach more for the teenagers, not the little ones. Uh, so they can explain what it means and uh, they can learn the song with the, the, the teenager and then bring them together. So, um, yeah, so then maybe they will become the keepers of our song because they would say, oh, this is, not, this is not just for pleasure or entertainment. There's something behind that. But I don't want to take the entire responsibility. I really want the Longhouse uh, singers to be there with me because it's a community uh, process, it's not me. So that's the way I thought I would do it. Mm. When I was kind of surprised at in finding a lot of this uh, scratching sticks, uh, you know, for, for those that are from our tribe, so we have a, a stick that during ceremonial times, particularly like after a, a battle, or somebody was killed and the person can't touch himself. And you had to use a, uh, if you itched someplace, you had to have a piece of stick that was used to scratch with. A girl's, uh, during her time of the month, she would also have one too. And so she wouldn't touch herself. And that had a lot to do with it. But I was, what I was surprised is, is how many were actually in the collections. But then again, too, that that's when the world was changing. And so people were selling their items when they didn't have the river to, you know, uh, take care of themselves. They had all these, uh, they had to make, uh, decisions and what am I, you know, what can I, what can I do to make money, and that's what kind of surprised me a lot is having to see so many uh, scratching sticks in in the collections. You get those were personal items. I was a true personal item because you only used it at certain times, and uh, so it, it it's it's one of those things that kind of baffled me too. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of the artists again and thank all of you for being here. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.